Hi everyone, my name is Aravindan Swedern. Today I will be going through the following presentation entitled Diffusion and Photon Recycling in Halide Perovskite Symptoms Insights from Experiment and Theory. This work was done in collaboration with our Princeton colleagues Nakita Noel and Barry Wren. In this work, we use time resolved imaging to study the diffusion of carriers in perovskite thin films. What we see here in the title figure is a perovskite thin film under a tightly focused laser illumination. The cone of light which enters the perovskite film initially generates electrons and holes, which are collectively known as charged carriers. These carriers then recombine and produce photoluminescence, otherwise referred to as PL. A fraction of the PL leaves the perovskite layer whereas some is wave guided within. A fraction of this waveguided light is reabsorbed by the perovskite material. This reabsorbed light can further be re-emitted as PL. Successive iterations of these processes which represent the coupled interaction between charged carriers and photons is called photon recycling. The optical power entering the film is dissipated into four main processes, as shown on the right hand side stack plot. When a photon is emitted, it can have one of four different outcomes. Direct reabsorption. Waveguiding, which also includes possible reabsorption along the way, substrate emission, or emission into free space. Let us first take a quick look at the existing literature on this subject. Various optical methods have been used in the past to measure lateral diffusion in perovskite thin films. Due to the impact of grain boundaries, lateral diffusion was found to be critical. This table displays a few of these measurements. The values shown for these methods conform well with older measurements from non-optical techniques along the z-direction such as spiel quenching and microwave conductivity measurements. The last entry on the table is the diffusion coefficient for a methyl ammonium lead triiodide sample from our most recent publication where we studied in-plane diffusion using a street camera microscope which could image PL coming from a laser excited perovskite film. The diffusion and recombination coefficients were subsequently extracted by fitting a diffusion model to the time-resolved PL data. Previous studies focused mostly on the z-direction, with emphasis on lifetimes, quantum yields, and device performance, whereas here we reapply the street camera technique to study photon recycling as well. There are many aspects in the interplay between diffusion and photon recycling which remain unclear. One important question is what proportion of PL is exactly created due to photon recycling in 2D propagation? Another important question is how does the diffusion coefficient change when photon recycling is involved? The study presented here attempts to explore these questions. Let us first explore the experimental setup. We use a diffraction limited pump and a street camera to map the PL in space and time. We also eventually show evolution of spectrum spatially along the spot as well as in time. The street camera microscopy setup is composed of three main parts. On the top right, we have the Fianium supercontinuum laser system and the beam shaping optics which magnify the beam. We use a 10 nanometer bandpass filter to extract a 532 nanometer source. In the entrance to the second area, we have a computer controlled neutral density filter wheel for adjusting the laser power. The beam splitter pair help couple both white light and the laser in between the objective and the tube lens of the microscope. The PL spot from the sample is imaged either by the CCD camera or the street camera. The flip mirror allows interchangeable use between the two. In this configuration, we can measure the spatiotemporal data as shown before. Alternatively, we can use a translation stage mounted optical fiber to scan the PL along the radial axis. While performing steady state PL measurements for different positions in this way, we find increased redshift of the spectrum as the distance increases as shown on the graph. Therefore, we perform time resolved spectral measurements to understand the observed spectral characteristics. Before looking at photon recycling, we first use a street camera on our samples to extract diffusion and recombination coefficients. This can be done using the experimental setup in the first configuration which allows extraction of the spatiotemporal distribution within the perovskite thin film. In this figure, we show the results for measurements performed in two different time windows, which are 200 nanoseconds and 1 nanosecond. Panels A and D show time normalized street camera data captured for an acetonitrile processed MAPBI3 or methyl ammonium lead triiodide sample. <laughs> 
For the 200 nanosecond window measurement, a sectional view alongside a model base fit is shown for R equals 0 microns in panel B. Also, horizontal sectional views are also shown for five different times in panel C. Similarly, sectional views are also shown for the 1 nanosecond measurement. We note the spreading is significantly different in both time windows. Although the 200 nanosecond measurement appears to have a larger spreading area, the widening within the 1 nanosecond window occurs at a faster rate. Here, we attempt to identify the cause of these varying spreading regimes. Particularly, we want to verify whether photon recycling is involved in the spreading mechanism. Now let us look at how the fits in the previous slide were obtained. The first part of the fitting procedure is defining the model. Here, we use a 3D diffusion model, which we will later modify for including photon recycling. The equation is expressed as follows. This equation is expressed in cylindrical coordinates with r, theta, and z as space variables. We assume isotropic diffusion and only use r and z. The variable n represents the excess charge carrier density. The variable g represents the laser generated charge carriers. In this model, however, we set g to zero and use an experimentally measured initial spatial profile to simulate the progression in time. d is the ambipolar diffusion coefficient. Here we assume that electrons and holes diffuse equally despite slight differences in reality owing to individual properties such as effective mass. The coefficients k1 and k2 respectively represent the monomolecular and bimolecular recombination rates. Here are some assumptions we make in our model. Our experiments are mostly conducted at high fluences. We safely assume that the excess charge carrier population is much higher than the intrinsic population. We also assume free carriers as perovskites exhibit very low binding energies under room temperature. Lastly, as the generation term is set to zero, we must make certain assumptions regarding the initial carrier population and G. We are either in a dominant monomolecular regime where N is proportional to G, or rather in a dominant bimolecular regime where N is proportional to the square root of G. Let us now look at the second part of the fitting procedure used to extract the diffusion and recombination coefficients. When using a high magnification objective, Diffusion actually has a direct impact on the shape of the lifetime curve. This is seen on this figure whereas D increases, the curvature is more pronounced at earlier times. Hence, to measure the recombination coefficients correctly, we safely negate the effect of D by using a lower magnification objective of 10x. We then numerically solve the diffusion equation in a forward time central space scheme. A nonlinear least squares regression is applied to our simulation results and the experimental data to extract the coefficients. We first fit k1 and k2 using a 10x objective. Then we fit d using results obtained from a higher 60x magnification measurement. One important advantage of using the street camera with this type of fitting procedure is that we can now differentiate apparent spreading from actual diffusion. Normally, the Gaussian spreading can be modeled by a linear equation as shown here with sigma squared as a function of time. However, radiative recombination in perovskites is bimolecular. At carrier densities where band-to-band -band recombination dominates, which is the case in these experiments, there is an apparent component to the spreading, which is not due to diffusion, but rather increased recombination in the peak of the radial Gaussian distribution as compared to the wings. And this is true even when the value of d is zero, as shown here by the equation for the effective diffusion coefficient. Now that we have all of the required starting coefficients, we can now dive into photon recycling. The continuity equations used to model photon recycling are shown here. We limit ourselves to two dimensions by eliminating the z variable to reduce computation time. First we have the equation for carrier diffusion, although with a new summation term corresponding to carriers generated from reabsorbed photons. Here we don't set the generation term to zero. Instead, 
By using a well-defined Gaussian pulse in space and time to model a laser pulse, we avoid the need for underlying re assumptions regarding G and N. The second equation is linked to the photon distribution within the film. The first term on the right corresponds to the spreading of photons. The second term relates to photons reabsorbed as carriers. Third, we have the source term for this differential equation corresponding to photons generated from recombining charge carriers. The number of photons depends on two probabilities. First is the probability of the photons remaining within the film, which is represented by the variable p stay. Second is the probability of emission at wavelength lambda. This is written as p lambda. Our calculations indicate the value of p stay for these films is about 0 0.85. With the model and parameters from the previous slide, we can now fully simulate spreading with photon recycling. In the 200 nanosecond window, we find a very low value of 7 times 10 to the power of minus 3, whereas in the 1 nanosecond window, the value is much higher at about 0.97. These values of D clearly reflect the two different spreading regimes which I mentioned before. One should note for the slow regime that on a scale comparable to the lifetime, the carriers basically don't move in space. We have also extracted the recombination coefficients in the longer time window. Using these values and the slow regime diffusion coefficient, we model photon recycling and the simulation results are shown here for two cases. First, we have p-stay equals to zero, which is in the case uh, of absence of photon recycling. In this case, no photons are generated by the source term in the second continuity equation. Consequently, only results for charged carriers are shown in panel A. The second case is for p stay equal to 0 0.85, when photon recycling is present. Panel B illustrates the charge carrier distribution for this scenario. By comparing both panels A and B, we immediately see that there is significantly more spatial spreading in B due to photon recycling. In regions more than a micron away from the pump, photon re re recycling leads to increase in the carrier density by over four orders of magnitude. Although carriers spread further in space due to photon recycling, the edge contribution to the densities is nearly five orders of magnitude lower than the values at center. Panels C, D, and E show the photon spatiotemporal distribution for three different wavelengths. Photons at longer wavelengths spread rapidly due to the smaller absorption coefficient, or equivalently, higher diffusion coefficient d lambda. These longer wavelength photons are the main contributors to the carrier densities far away from the spot. Now let us analyze the data shown in the previous slide in detail. The sectional and time integrated views of the spatial temporally distributed densities are presented here. The top three panels show normalized lifetimes for carriers and photons at various positions in space. The three figures in the bottom show time integrated radial profiles on a logarithmic Y scale. The first column corresponds to the one without photon recycling and consequently only the carriers are shown. The second and third columns represent the situation with photon recycling for charged carriers followed by photon densities. In all lifetime panels, we observe an elongation in lifetimes as we move from the center. This is due to the reduced influence of higher order recombination. At further distances, there is a delay in the peaking of generated carriers. This lag is linked to the time that carriers take to reach that position from the center through diffusion. For photon recycling, charged carriers are generated even at distances of 10 microns, as seen in the bottom figures. Since the radial profiles are shown on a logarithmic scale, it may appear that tails are heavily populated, but most of the carrier density is located in the central region below 1 micron. Let us now look at the spectral behavior when photon recycling is present. The densities shown here correspond purely to the internally waveguided fraction of photons and not those radiated into free space. Panels A and C show the spatial and spectral mapping of absolute and normalized photon densities. Sectional views for up to 3 micron are shown in panel B. These figures show a clear redshift in the peak wavelength with increasing position. This is due to reabsorption where higher energy photons are absorbed in a greater proportion as a consequence of the overlap between the absorption and emission spectra.
The bottom panels show the evolution of the spectrum as a function of time and three positions. The spectrum shifts from 754 nanometer to 764 nanometer, and lastly to 775 nanometer. These positions chosen for the simulation correspond to physical experimental positions. In the beginning, I mentioned there being a redshift with increasing position in steady state PL measurements. This figure depicts the PL profile showing the three positions where the street camera measurements were performed. A careful analysis shows that those observations are not related to the redshift in the wave guided photon spectrum due to photon recycling, but instead due to band filling. To quantitatively explain this, we fit the absorption spectrum of our sample to an Elliott model and then model the PL as a function of quasi Fermi level splitting. The result of this modeling is shown in panel C, which illustrates a relationship between carrier density and peak wavelength as derived from the band filling calculation. We plot experimental values obtained from panels A and B for comparison. Panel A shows the peak wavelength of the spectrum as a function of time. Panel B exhibits the corresponding space integrated lifetimes at each position. The good overlap between the experimental data and the model indicates band filling is an important factor in the spectral shift. Lastly, in panel D, we use the band filling results to convert photon recycling simulation densities to wavelengths. The trends in these curves match well with the data presented in panel A. This provides further evidence that band filling is a primary contributor to the spectral shift. We have studied the effect of varying diffusion, fluence, and photon recycling on our simulation. The panels are ordered left to right by increasing diffusion coefficient. In each panel, there are two sets of lines with colors matching different fluences which are shown in the legend. The dotted set is for p state equals zero, or when photon recycling is absent, whereas the solid set of lines correspond to photon recycling being turned on. When photon recycling is off, there is a rapid spreading at early times due to higher order recombination. However, this later stabilizes. Our results primarily show a clear enhancement of spreading when photon recycling is turned on for low values of D. Increasing the fluence translates to more spreading irrespective of photon recycling. However, when photon recycling is combined to higher fluence, there is a disproportionate increase in spreading. This is actually due to a high internal quantum yield, as you can see in these plots where PL emission is higher. However, increasing values of D eventually appears to overpower this effect as clearly seen in panel C. To summarize, we have studied spatial, temporal, and spectral aspects of the interplay between diffusion and photon recycling. The table shown here illustrates the pros and the cons of using the street camera technique. As for the results, our simulations show a clear increase in spreading caused by photon recycling. This is particularly evident at higher fluence where an increased quantum yield produces more photons. As for the observed redshift in our spectral measurements, we explored both photon recycling as well as band filling as potential causes. Among the two, band filling results explain the spectral shift much better. Although we did not completely explain the varying spreading regimes, these calculations bring further clarity to the nature of spreading when photon recycling is present. On this note, I would like to conclude my presentation and thank you all for listening.